Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Wednesday, July 24th, and you are listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Well, our topic for this morning is still Luke, but now we're in chapter 14. Jesus captivates with powerful lessons on humility and generosity and the cost of discipleship. He heals a man with dropsy on the Sabbath, challenging the Pharisees' strict rules. And then at a banquet, he advises choosing the lowest place and encourages inviting the poor and the marginalized, promising heavenly rewards. Through the parable of the great banquet, Jesus shows how the rejected are welcome into God's kingdom. And he concludes with a compelling call for total commitment, urging his followers to prioritize him above all things. Thank you, friends, for stopping by this morning and hanging out with us as we delve into the Bible verse by verse. Over the air, online, through the app, or as a podcast, we're here for you. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Visit them online at lhfmissions.org to learn more. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Probably the best way is through email, thystrongword at kfuo.org. But you can still also find me on Facebook by searching for Phil Boo and sending me a friend request or just a direct message and we'll chat. Well, let's get right to our guest this morning. It's the Reverend Benjamin Meyer. He's the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Condit, Ohio. Good morning, Pastor Meyer, and welcome back to the program. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Yeah, it's great. I a Condit. Did I pronounce that right with Ohio? Yeah, I mean, they technically no. <laughs> they it's a Sunbury address, uh, but we're Condit is ah. this little speck between uh, Sunbury and, and Centerburg where I live, and not that either of those are huge metropolises either. <laughs> However, uh, uh, yeah, we're we're kind of off in the middle where where things are starting to catch up to where we are, but they're not there I yet. You. Reminds me of my first call. We got the, you know, walked across the stage and they said, rural Purim, Minnesota. And I'm like, where <laughs> is rural Purim? Well, they called it rural Purim because they didn't know the real name, which was Corliss, Minnesota. They didn't have a post office. So, yeah, I get it. I get it how the names can kind of blend into each other. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, yeah. we have a lot to cover today. In fact, it's been become very apparent to me that I have bitten off more than we can chew in my divisions of Luke here in these, these later chapters. But, uh. 13, we didn't quite finish, so I want to start with verse 31 of 13, and then we'll dive right into our text for today. But before I do even that, please start us off with a word of prayer and ask that the Lord helps us be efficient today as we get through the rest of the text. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I listened listened to that yesterday, and yeah, you you were were having to speed right along, and we'll have to do that again today, but let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, Our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word, that by true diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who might be mildly interested at home, I do pick all the books that we are going to go through. But of course, I pick from the same 66 books that my brother in arms does for Sharper Iron. So I always try to make sure that we're not covering too close to the same books at the same time. But then I have to then divide it up. And so, yeah, Luke was maybe a little little ambitious. I will say, though, moving forward, we have some great topics coming up. We have First and Second Thessalonians, then Amos and then Hosea. And I've been very intentional about making sure we have plenty of elbow room to talk. But today, let's get right to it so I don't end up in the same spot. And I don't want to miss this, though, because it really does provide some context for what we are going to talk about today. So it it works out anyway. I'm going to read verses 31 through 35 of Luke 13. At that hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, 
for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, brother. Well, this does set the stage because next in our assigned text, he's going to talk uh, with a ruler of the Pharisees when he's eating with them. But here, some Pharisees are coming after Jesus saying, get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. Um, <laughs> I have a feeling they weren't so concerned about Jesus's welfare as so much as they were just looking to move him along. Yeah, it's, it seems like a convenient excuse to try to get Jesus out of the way because he's really causing some headaches for us. You know, if we could just get that Jesus guy out of here, then uh, we can go back to life as we liked it and uh, go back to doing things the way we were doing them without having this guy calling us out all the time. Uh, and so I think it became just a, a way of saying, hey, look how concerned we are for you, Jesus. Move, move along. Get out of here. Uh, but in reality, this is uh, just another one of their manipulations. And he tells them, go and tell that fox. And he gives them a message to take back to Herod. Now, he knows they're not going back to Herod. And who even knows if Herod really even gave such a message at this point? I mean, probably. But he basically is telling them, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They should have recognized that he was indeed doing the work of the Messiah. That that's his point. Yeah, they they should have. This is kind of the same answer when John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus when John is arrested, uh, and they're they're asking, "Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another?" And he says, you know, the blind see, uh, the deaf receive their hearing and the lame walk and, and so forth. Well, it's the same idea here. All of these miracles are evidences of Jesus being who he claims to be, being the Messiah that they should have been looking for. These are the people above all who should see, oh, wow, this guy's doing all the things the Old Testament prophets said the Messiah would do. We should be putting our trust in him uh, instead of trying to get rid of him. And Jesus knows, I think, more than they know in this situation. And he lets out that he knows more than they know by his, well, not so subtle uh, attack on the religious establishment. You know, old Jerusalem, right. the city that kills the prophets. So I, I think he's kind of letting them know, hey, your your rhetoric is going to be <laughs> is going to come back to bite you because, I, you know, death is coming for me. But woe to you by whom it comes. Right. The, Jerusalem is known for rejecting God's prophets. And, well, frankly, you're just following in the tradition of many who've come before you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, 70 A.D. would come and Jerusalem would be just utterly destroyed. Uh, but uh, Jesus also includes in here that prophecy of, well, uh, you're not going to see me again, you know, Jerusalem, that is, until, you know, you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we see that very thing happen on Palm Sunday when he does ride into Jerusalem and he's greeted in that way. Uh, and, you know, Jerusalem welcomes him and yet not all of Jerusalem, certainly. Right. And, and you know what? And just for the sake of putting the best construct on things, we've read through this little passage with a particular viewpoint, and that is that the Pharisees there were not so concerned with Jesus' welfare, but just moving him along. And I think that's a very fair interpretation, pretty much the one I would take because of Jesus' admonition at the end. But it's also worth reminding folks that not every Pharisee was was against Jesus, and not they, they weren't a monolith. And so in this next mm -hmm. section— we have him um, dining with a Pharisee, um, and while he does certainly give some instructions, um, he, he, it, there's no indication that he's really trying to trick Jesus. Um, but let's see. Let's see. Let's read through. Maybe I could be wrong. Let's start with 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, 
when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and he healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. So this uh, harkens back, brother, to the incident that we read about yesterday. That's the woman with the disabling spirit. And the ruler of the synagogue there was very upset with Jesus healing or working on the Sabbath. Um, they're watching Jesus here, but but he he kind of broaches the topic. Do you are these the same Pharisees that were related? Would they have known what he was referencing, or is this a new event, or what do we know? Well, Luke doesn't necessarily give us all the details here, does he? He doesn't say ah same group or hey different group. Um, and so I think people have read into this ah a trap was being laid for Jesus, and perhaps that's true. Perhaps mm -hmm. the man with dropsy didn't just happen to appear, but they made sure he was going to be there. Um, on the other hand, you know, putting the best construction on everything, perhaps that's not the case. Perhaps it was just they had invited Jesus and uh, they had invited this man with dropsy to be there. And so it was not a trap, uh, but Jesus still uses it as a teaching opportunity to show them what the Sabbath is really about. It's, it's not just let's sit idly and not do anything, uh, but it's, it's, it's really about the will of God. And so doing good for your neighbor is not prohibited. You know, helping this person who was in need when they're suffering, uh, that's not off limits according to the law. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas they wanted to read everything so rigidly that they would say, no, you, you can't even help this guy on the Sabbath. You want to do it tomorrow, that's fine, but he's just going to have to suffer with it for today. And Jesus is using this as a teaching opportunity to show them, uh, no, that's really not the case. He says to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. Um, you and I both, we, we talk for a living. We, we prepare sermons. Um, I think if I were writing that, I would probably put ox before son because I would think one is more of more importance than the other, which always makes me wonder. I know that Greek has a flexibility in word order, but having a son or gosh, even an ox that has fallen into a well, I don't know. Jesus' response to them seems to put on display not only their hypocrisy that if things were important to them, they would take care of it, but also, I don't know, maybe there's a hint of just how their priorities are even mixed up. Yeah, I think for sure uh, what Jesus is doing here is, well, what's the fulfillment of the law? It, it's love, love for others. Well, you love your son. If your son fell into a hole, you'd help him out. If your ox fell into a hole, you'd, you'd help it out. Maybe if for no other reason than love of your own family and what that ox means for your family. Uh, but now you're saying, if this other person, this stranger is in need, well, I'm not any, under any obligation to help him. And, and that's not the fulfillment of the law. Love is going to be the fulfillment of the law. And so love would require that Jesus is able, and here is this person in need, and this person has, has come to him for help. Well, Jesus will help. And so Jesus actually fulfills the law where they think that they're fulfilling the law, but in reality, they're falling far, far short. Absolutely. Uh, just for folks who like the kind of detail that doesn't always come out, uh, I'm not the only one who had, a, I think, a weird reaction to Jesus's ordering of son then ox, because some of the manuscripts actually replace son with donkey, a donkey or an ox. Mm -hmm. But that's just another mm -hmm. example that the point remains the same, and that is the things you care about, the things in your life, the things for your family, the things that you own – yeah, you're you're gonna you're not gonna have the same rules and regulations against helping them, and as our guest has said, but we're called to love 
even our enemies, right? We're called to love those even outside of our families and frankly, our congregations. We're to love them. And sometimes that happens on a Sabbath day, but it's okay because that's not work. It's love. It's love. Uh, And I didn't get into the story too much, but I did briefly mention yesterday that Yeah, you know, I grew up and people are trying to determine whether it was okay to go out and eat on Sunday because someone has to work or whether softball practice counted, you know, a game's off limits. That's work. But practice is, you know, there was all kinds of reasonings by behind people, even in modern eras of how to not break this commandment. And I guess on the one hand, it's good that people are trying to be pious in appropriate ways. On the other hand, it kind of misses the point, doesn't it? Yeah, we're re- we're really good at turning um, God's ways into just rigid rules. We we like to have that kind of rigidity uh, rather than uh, really gospel freedom. You know, there there's a lot of gospel freedom where we are free to do things or not do things. Uh, but it's it kind of reminds me of when I was in in school and the the, the professor would say, all right, here's the paper. It's due this day. And immediately a hand would go up. How long does it have to be? (laughs) (laughs) So the students want to know exactly what are you Mm -hmm. expecting? What, what do you want here? Cause that's exactly what I want to try to meet rather than, uh, I'm, it needs to be as long as it needs to be to cover the material. Well, don't tell me that. I, I want to know the minimum that I have to do to get away with this thing. Yep. Uh, we do that with the law of God. We like to say, what's the, what's the minimum I have to do in order to observe the law of God? And so it's actually easier for these Pharisees to say, uh, well, I'm, I'm keeping the law of God by not doing anything to help this person rather than stepping in and, and doing something that might cost them in order to help that person who is in need. You know, I've always described it too, as oftentimes we want to know where those boundaries are so that we can also scooch up as close to them as we can without going oh, over. Yeah. So sometimes it's not even about the minimum to obey. It's about the, what's the max I can do without disobeying, which again, this is right. the point, but you're right. We do right. this all the time. We see this with the, the lawyer who says, you know, what must I do? And Jesus says, well, what do you think? And he goes, well, take care of my neighbor. And he goes, okay, go do that. And he goes, yeah, but who exactly is my neighbor, right? <laughs> he wants to know so that he can do the right. bare minimum. Well, right. you know, I think that the bare minimum would certainly be to love people on the Sabbath. It's it's just amusing in a cosmic kind of way. It's tragic on the ground, but that these Pharisees um, were ignoring the the... <laughs> absolutely amazing miracles that Jesus was performing. It was eluding them because they were so concentrated on whether or not he should be performing them on that certain day. Um, And Mm -hmm. I think we have to be very careful about not missing the work of God that's going on around us because it's not being done in the exact way that we think it should be. Right. Not the way that I would choose to do it. Therefore it's got to be bad. Instead of, putting the best, best construction on things and saying, ah, well, that it's not the way I would have done it. But look, God is glorified. Our neighbor is served. Thanks be to God. Right, right, exactly. And and folks at home, your, your pastors are not strangers to this because I would, I'm going to go ahead on a, on a limb and say we've all experienced where we've sat listening to a sermon. It doesn't matter how great or how effective it was or how much the Lord was working through it. We go, eh, well, I would have said it this way, or I would have done it that mm-hmm. way. And we inadvertently sometimes even reject our own brother's proclamations because we're too concentrated on the way we would have done it. So I think it's something we have to be careful about. Yeah, pride is what underlies so much of this. And throughout this chapter, we see that idea of pride and, and what it does and the, the problems that it causes. And that's the same thing that you're talking about there, right there. You know, sitting yeah. there listening to a brother pastor preach and your pride is leading you to go, well, I, uh, I would have <laughs> said it better or I would have said it this way or he shouldn't have done it this way uh, instead right. of just receiving the gift. When I was a vicar, I was terrified about having to preach in front of all the uh, pastors of my circuit until I got up there. And these guys are 
counting the ceiling tiles and flipping through the books. And I was just like, oh, well, no one's <laughs> listening. So no, there, there, I wasn't the that bad. Said, the worst audience you can ever have. <laughs> oh, but it's true. That part's true. That part's true. Yeah, they weren't that bad. But it, but honestly, it was part of me goes, oh, I, I'm not quite sure why I was so worried, you know. But I tell you what, let's move on because you mentioned pride and humility is certainly part of Jesus's teaching today. And we see that in verses 7 through 11. Now, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come to you and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when your host comes up, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, if there isn't a teaching that is uh, more prevalent in potluck suppers than this one, I don't know. I don't know how often we hear, no, 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 you go ahead. No, 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 the last will be first. The first will be last. But... Um, false humility aside, Jesus has a good point here. He's actually attaching some practicality to it. It isn't just take humble places so that you're holy. He says, take humble places because you're going to be embarrassed if you try to exalt yourself in this world, both before men and before God, of course. Well, yeah, I, our, our pride leads us to think more of ourselves than we ought. And I think all of us have been guilty of this and regularly are guilty of this. And uh, I think pride underlies so much of our sin problem uh, because we just make ourselves to be the idol. And so uh, humility is the opposite of pride. It, it's thinking of others as being greater than yourself. And that does not come naturally. What comes naturally is putting myself first. Uh, but Humility, love of others, building up others, thinking of others as greater, not, not taking the lower position because you're saying, I'm, I'm so full of pride, I'm going to take the lower position because uh, I want others to be built up, but, but genuinely loving them, thinking of them as greater than yourself. Uh, that really is something I think only the Holy Spirit can bring about in us. Uh, James talks about this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Uh, I think part of our problem with pride is, is we think if nobody exalts, if, if nobody exalts me, uh, well, if, if I don't exalt me, <laughs> nobody's going to do it. Uh, right. If I don't get, uh, you know, do things to make sure I get noticed, well, how will I be noticed? And Scripture reminds us here, well, the Lord notices. The Lord sees your, your good works for others. The Lord sees how you love others, and you will be rewarded for those things. Uh, but if you try to take that for yourself, uh, now you're going to be embarrassed. Your pride is going to get the better of you. There is a quote from Ronald Reagan, actually, that said, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he could go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And mm. I think that that type of thinking is inspired, at least in part, by this idea. When we go out in the world, you know, we want to elevate ourselves because, as you said, we're afraid that some people won't. And then I think another the other side of that coin is when we become envious over those who are being maybe exalted for some good reason, uh, but nothing that, that praises others takes away from what you do. But it's all based on this idea of pride. So, yes, yeah, saying that I'm going to sit in the low place so that I can be brought forward absolutely isn't what Jesus is teaching here. Yeah, and I think this – is a problem in the church. Uh, you know, we'll see, oh, this person is elevated to this spot. And well, I, I think I could do a better job than that person. I, I know the faults that person has. And so uh, there's there's that pride that uh, gets the better of us, or, or maybe we're the one that does get moved up uh, in some way. And we start thinking of ourselves as, as being better than others, when in reality, 
the the higher that you are elevated in terms of your responsibilities in the church, the lower you are in, in terms of who you are to serve. You're beneath even more people and responsible to serve even more people. And so it's it's not about you. It's about the Lord and it's about uh, taking care of the Lord's people and honoring them and loving them and, and uh, actually thinking of them as greater than yourself. God's word isn't about us, it's for us. And certainly this encourages us to serve our neighbors in humility. And we, and we do that, of course, recognizing what God has done for us. This is more than just social etiquette, etiquette that Jesus is dishing out here. These are some spiritual truths that they are simply missing as they parade around looking for accolades in the city square with long prayers that get people recognizing them. Um, has a lot to say to us today, too, especially in social media where we're all vying for the same clicks and attention. I think uh, the human nature itself, the fallen human nature, can get, get led astray pretty quickly. Well, that's stuff we'll have to talk about a little more when we get back because we're right now at the time for break. So, folks, don't go anywhere. When we come back, we'll keep on going through Luke chapter 14. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back, folks, to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend Benjamin Meyer, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Condit, Ohio. I'm always happy to hear from listeners. I do strive to respond to your feedback. You can email me, brand new email address, fancy, still has that new email address smell, right? Thy Strong Word at kfuo.org. Go ahead and give it a try. Send me a hello. Make sure it's working. I have gotten some emails already, and I always respond, but sometimes it takes a little while. You can also find me on Facebook. Uh, you can send me a message or send me a friend request either way. I'm tinkering with going out to some other social media. I don't know. Not a big fan of social media. What about you, brother? How are you on social media? Are you pretty out there in every different corner or just one or two or none? Oh, I, uh, Facebook, mostly for the sake of the, the church. And then uh, <laughs> I use uh use Twitter, I guess X now, um, it just as a way of trying to get God's word out there for people and uh, make some connections. Well, that's good. You know, I, I've, I've tried them all at one point or another, and sometimes for me, it becomes a little bit of doom scrolling, as they say. I can get caught in a little bit of a habit of just kind of scrolling through it. So I have to have some discipline when it comes to social media. I, I know a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I I try to use it as a, a way to bring light to the darkness and don't get caught up in the uh, controversies. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's that's something I definitely encourage folks to try to avoid, Christians and pastors alike. You know, we need to be out there spreading the truth, and so be careful with what you share online. Okay, well, let's get back to what Jesus is sharing with us today. So he's going to give some parables, three of them, actually, while he's at the Pharisee's house. The first is directed towards his guests, which we just heard. Now we're going to hear 12 through 14, and it's going to cover this second parable. Here he says, here he goes. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. 
All right. So parabolic teaching, not quite a parable, but still we have Jesus giving him this example of, hey, if you're going to give a dinner, don't be like everybody else. Be like a faith person of faith, a child of God. Invite those who cannot repay you. Um, another thing I think all humans struggle with, right? Giving, giving grace to those who can give you nothing in return. Yeah, I, I, I think... Jesus is not excluding, is saying you can't invite friends and family, but what he's saying is don't forget, you should also be inviting those people that can't do a thing for you. Uh, Include them, have a sense of generosity for them, uh, because your, your heavenly father is generous with you and he will continue to be generous with you. Uh, I think it's easy for us in the church to get into where we're comfortable And so maybe you get done with church on Sunday. Okay, we're going to have a family dinner. And so we get together with the same people every week and we have our family dinner. And we don't even recognize that we're excluding people, not intentionally, but we're just not intentionally including them and people that might not have that same sense of community that we have. Uh, I think what, what, Jesus is so good at and and teaching us here is uh, we want to include more and more and more. We want the the kingdom to grow. We want that sense of community to be experienced by all because it's it's good. It's a, a godly gift. And we don't want others to be excluded from that because of their shortcomings or because they can't do it the same kind of thing for us in return. We want to simply be generous in in inviting and including. And the people that Jesus is pointing out here, too, aren't just like others that can't pay you back. They're social outcasts, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. So it's not only just people who don't have money or aren't in the same socioeconomic strata that you are, but he's also talking about people that, well— the Jewish folks would have ascribed as having some sort of sinful defect about them. The reason why they experiencing these bad things is because God is not for them or God is punishing them. Jesus is flipping that idea on his head and saying, no, this is who I've come for. This is who you Mm -hmm. come for. Um, So it also speaks a little bit about what the perceived relationship with God is. So those who are wealthy, well, God's blessing them. It's the people who aren't mm-hmm. wealthy. Well, I'm going to stay away with them because obviously they've done something wrong. And that's what Jesus is also saying. Hey, listen, let's not think like that anymore. Yeah, I think when we fail to understand that our place in God's kingdom is entirely by grace, then we get ourselves into trouble. And, and I think we actually see this with the the whole idea of the puritanical work ethic. Well, why did the Puritans work so hard? It was to show that they had the favor of God because if they had success, if they were successful in life, they could point to that and say, ah, see, I'm one of the blessed of God. I'm one of the favored by God. I'm part of the kingdom. And they would have had the same trouble in in looking at these who uh, were crippled, lame and blind. Well, they, they are clearly not the favored of God. There must be something wrong that they have done. Uh, So they're not the favored. Well, Jesus doesn't operate that way at all. Uh, He elevates those that would be considered the least, and he lowers those who uh, in society are often considered to be the greatest. How do you think that we fail in this regard today? What are some practical things that we can look for, or maybe on a more positive way, what can we do to make sure that we're following Jesus's teaching in the 2024? I think one, one very simple thing would be look, look around at your church. Who is the the person or the people who are kind of off on their own, who are, who are not always included or, or welcomed as, as warmly might even be kind of hard to get along with sometimes might, might be social outcasts in part because of their own actions. Well, how can we include them? How can we reach out to them? How can we show grace to them? Uh, because you're definitely not getting a benefit, (laughs) uh, when you're 
when you're doing that, right? And, and that's the point Jesus makes. Uh, we want to invite and include uh, entirely out of grace, not because we think there's going to be some uh, side benefit for us. One of the guys listening to Jesus' teachings here, he he got really excited about this idea that we want to be inclusive to the to all people. And in verse fifteen, he says, "When one of the, well, sorry, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, "Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God." But Jesus responds to him with now the the main parable from these interactions. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. The servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go quickly out into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and there is still room. And the master said to the serpent, Go out into the highways then, into the hedges, and compel the people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Now, why is that Jesus' response to the man who says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God? Because Luke says, but he said to him. So Jesus is responding to that message. What, why is he doing that? Well, I think the assumption that the man has is, I'm one of those who will eat in the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, so... He's challenging the assumptions that people have because they're they're assuming that that they'll be part of this kingdom for the wrong reasons, uh, and he's he's making it clear to them how this actually works, how the kingdom of God works, uh, and so you know the man gave a great banquet, he invited many, and well, they all start making excuses. Uh, well, I, I bought a field. I have to go see it. Uh, please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another, I have married a wife. <laughs> he yeah, doesn't even ask for it to be excused on that one. He's just like, I, I got married. I can't call. He's like, no, my <laughs> wife won't let me. My wife won't let my, me come. That's right. My, my wife's not going to let that happen. <laughs> uh, and... You know, so they, they are all making excuses about why they can't come to the banquet. Well, what is Jesus saying? Uh, well, I've invited. I've invited you. But it is by faith in me that you come. And you're all saying, no, uh, I'll, I'll come on my own terms. Or I'm not really interested in, in the, the way you're doing this, Jesus. Uh, uh, and and so he's he's saying, look, there is only one way. You want to keep... Uh, refusing the offer, well, eventually you're going to very much regret that. Uh, but the offer is going to go out to to all, including those that you think have no way of getting into the kingdom, into to the banquet. Uh, these people that you think there's no chance they're going to be a part of this, well, they're going to receive that invitation and many of them will come, many of them will believe, and they will be included. I think that the the hatred, the disdain for outsiders was so prevalent among some of these Pharisees that they probably wouldn't want to go to heaven if certain people would be there. I mean, Jesus is really hitting at some long-held prejudices that it's sometimes a little tough for us to identify with, and then at other times, unfortunately, we can easily identify with them. And so Jesus is giving them this message of being humble, having humility, seeking to take care of those who are on the outskirts, um, all things that the Christian faith should should uphold. Now, the next section that comes, though, Jesus is moving on from this uh, encounter. He's now walking again, and Luke tells us that great crowds are coming to him, and he's going to teach them some stuff. So here we go, verse 25. 
Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And uh, that's uh, the it from Jesus for this chapter. But here he's saying something pretty scandalous. In fact, it's so scandalous that I've had people react negatively when I have read these words of Jesus and taught them and preached them. He says, if you don't hate your own family, even your own self, you cannot be my disciple. Well, that doesn't sound very Christ-like, does it? <laughs> yeah, love, love, love. That's what it's all about. Ah, except uh, you got to hate your brother, right? Uh, well, no. And, and what is Jesus really trying to get across here? He's not saying, I want you to hate other people. But what he's saying is, in comparison with your love for, for the Lord, your affection for others is going to be so far removed. It's going to be so much lesser um, that it doesn't even compare. Uh, if you if you want to prefer your own father or mother or wife or children or brothers or sisters, even your own life over Christ, well, uh, then you're not a disciple of Jesus. Uh, we have to recognize life is only found in Jesus. And so when we get things ordered correctly, then our love for others will, will fall into place correctly. It's kind of how it works with the Ten Commandments. You start with the first commandment, right? Love for God. Well, the others are going to flow from that. And so our, our love for parents and, and others, well, you get to the, uh, uh, the fourth commandment and we see, okay, yeah. There is that that's the proper place, but it's going to it's going to follow. It's going to flow out of that that love for God, which comes first. You know, Jesus is talking about, frankly, just the reality that whenever people whom you love uh, oppose something that you, you like or whatever, you often will go their way after. Right? Blood is thicker than water, all that kind of stuff. And so if you are being influenced by those who you love against Christianity, Jesus is saying, no, you have to reject that and follow me. And, and I see this often, and i got to be very careful with how I phrase this because I don't want to communicate the wrong thing. But oftentimes you'll have folks come up, and I, I suspect this has happened to you. About every pastor has dealt with this. And they'll have suddenly decided that things that were long taught by the Bible in the church suddenly do not apply or are not something they believe in anymore because someone in their family has adopted a lifestyle. For instance, homosexuality or even living together outside of marriage or maybe mm -hmm. divorce suddenly is a no, no big deal once they need to face that unfortunate consequence. And so I've seen so many people because someone they love has now rejected parts of the scripture that they too reject them because they want to love. Love's all that counts. Love's all that matters. Now, what I didn't want people to hear me say is that you should hate those people. That's not even what Jesus is saying. But this hyperbolic statement by Jesus that says, if you're going to let your love of family come between me and uh, you, that's not a long-term strategy that's going to work. Well, and we see that happen with that that guy in the in the previous parable, right? 
Oh, I, I, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Right. Well, yeah. Well, he has chosen love of his wife over love of the Lord. And so things are out of order. They're not in the created order in which God has arranged them to be. Uh, and so uh, things are going to go badly as a result of that. Uh, th- this section also reminds me, uh, we, I, I work with the, uh, uh, the Central Ohio Lutheran Immigrant Mission. And part of what the groups that we uh, reach out to are, are Somalis. And Somalis uh, are amongst the, the least reached people groups in the world because you hmm. you can't go to Somalia as a missionary. You'll just be killed. Uh, but the Lord is bringing those folks here. And we have an opportunity to reach them with a the gospel. And, and one of the men that we have uh, been able to, to reach out to and share the gospel with, who, who has come to faith and been baptized and now is, is uh, reaching out to, to others, uh, well, he, he's cut off from his community as a result of that. Mm. He is, is cut off from those people that previously would have been his, uh, his go-to resources, the people that would have claimed to love him. But because he's, he's come to faith in Christ, he is now rejected, isolated, and it would be far easier for him to turn his back on Christ and go back to uh, being a, a Muslim and, and walking in those ways uh, physically, it would be far easier. Emotionally, he would face a lot less uh, hostility. And yet right. he says, I can't do that. I won't do that because I know what I have in Jesus. And, and nothing compares to that. So I'm not going to turn my back on Jesus. I'm not going to go back to that because I, I know what I have with Jesus. What a powerful witness that is to us, too. For we may not face the same kind of oh, excruciating separation from our family that, say, a Muslim coming to faith in Christ might experience, but we certainly are going to continue to experience all the more friends who leave us because we choose Christ over the things of this world. Um, frankly, even other small little uh, persecutions, uh, jobs and governments and everything else who look at us and say that we're radical for the things that we believe, teach, and confess— um, and and certainly uh, we're going to have to make a decision, um, well, many decisions on whether or not we are going to stay faithful to what God has given us or go after the easy way, which, as you said, for this gentleman, you know, he he would not be separated from his family anymore if he just, you know, even just gave lip service to Islam. But he cannot do that mm-hmm. out of his faith. And so the words right, of Jesus right. here come to be really really important in this man's life. And like I said, he's a witness to us too. What a great, what a great uh, testimony. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's an inspiring thing because, uh, you know, we, we think that we face hostility and then we see something like that and, and that's real <laughs> right. hostility. Yes. And yet his conviction is uh, un, unmoved. You know, he, he is on Christ, a solid rock. Indeed. So he says, though, I think Jesus is also getting – I don't want to ascribe to him um, emotions that aren't appropriate, but annoyed maybe because there's so many people who are following Jesus who frankly probably don't know why they're following him. They're going along with the crowd. Maybe they're in it for the attention. They're in it for the wrong reasons. They're there to uh, trip him up and cause him problems, or maybe they're just curious onlookers. But Jesus is letting them know that if they continue to follow, follow him, He's he's going into the direction where there's going to be persecution and death. And so he gives them these examples of war and even just building a tower. Uh, aren't you going to kind of figure out if this is something you're willing to do before you jump right in or you're even able to do? That seems to be the message that he's giving with those who want to follow him. How does that square with our understanding about, you know, being called to faith? Is Jesus telling us that we should? I don't know. What is Jesus telling us? I guess is maybe. Well, I, I, I think he's what he's what he's doing is he's being real. He, he's not letting us uh, think that if you simply follow him, everything's just going to be easy peasy. You won't have to worry about anything. No troubles. Uh, he, he's being real. Uh, you want to follow me? It's going to get hard sometimes. There, there will be persecution. 
Uh, you know, these are not the kinds of phrases that, that churches put on their church signs, right? Deny yourselves, take <laughs> right. off your cross and follow Jesus. Uh, you know, it, we, we want to make it as appealing as possible. And then people come and they go, you know, ever since I've started coming to church, I, I faced uh, these different hardships. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. Satan's going to attack. The world is going to attack uh, because Satan does not want people walking with the Lord. Uh, and, and so Jesus is being real. He, he's not pretending that if you come to faith in him, if you call yourself a Christian, uh, everything's just going to be easy. You won't have any marital troubles. Your kids will all grow up perfectly. Uh, your neighbors will love you and be thankful for you. Uh, <laughs> he says, no, there, there's a cost. There's a cost involved. And, and you need to know that. And it's more than worth the cost. But there is a cost that has to be paid. You know, I think about, you know, the, the book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the, the cost of discipleship. Well, uh, he was seeing in his own day those giving lip service versus those who were committed to living for Christ. And uh, I think that inspired some of, of where he was coming from. And, and he was willing to lay down his life for the sake of Christ. What about being salty? Salt is good, but if salt's lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's pretty much worth nothing at that point. Um, it, the ESP editors seem to think that this is, I don't know, they're, they're trying to communicate something. They space it apart from the other part of Jesus's teaching. I don't know if, if this is connected or something new. Um, how do you interpret this in the last few minutes we have on the program? Yeah, I, I, I tend to ignore any of the headings. <laughs> Because I don't know if they're very helpful. I think sometimes they're not very helpful. Uh, I think sometimes they give you a, a presupposition about what the next section is supposed to be about when sometimes right. I think the editors don't get it right. Uh, so I tend to just ignore those things and, and read the text. Uh, yeah, salt well, to is To their good. credit, there's no heading this time. It's just a long space. So maybe I'm just reading too much into it. But oh, okay. Salt well, I, is I, have a, I have a heading on mine. Uh, salt oh, without nice. taste is worthless. Uh, <laughs> well, there we go. In, I the, see. in the Lutheran study Bible here. Um, but yeah, salt, salt is good, right? So the salt was valuable in, in the ancient world. Uh, the word salary comes from salt. Uh, but if salt loses its saltiness, well, can it be restored? Well, no, it just gets thrown out. It, it's useless. It's worthless. Um, we, uh, we are called to be the salt of the earth. In fact, not just called to be. Jesus makes us to be the salt of the earth. Now, I think the good news for us is <laughs> when we lose our saltiness, we actually can be restored. You know, how does that happen? Well, by daily contrition and repentance. The old Adam is drowned and die and a new man emerges to live before the Lord in, 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 in purity. So we going back to our baptism, confession and absolution, coming to the Lord's table, we are restored to the, the saltiness. Uh, and so you know, Luther says in the, the questions and answers about the Lord's Supper, you know, why do you desire to, to receive this so that I might learn to love God and love my neighbor? Well, uh, that's saltiness. That's, that's sharing the, the love of God with the world around you, making things better around you. Uh, that can be restored in us when it's been lost by going back to the one who makes us the salt of the earth. Indeed. Indeed. And for those who are thinking maybe like, well, how can salt lose its saltiness? Like, is, is Jesus even speaking about something that can happen? Ah, it's worth throwing out there and it's not spiritually, you know, enriching or anything. But their salt at the time would have been pretty impure. It had been mixed of mm -hmm. sodium chloride with other things. And that sodium chloride could be washed out by rain and other things. So anyway, um, salt is it is possible for salt to lose its saltiness if you understand the context. But as our, as our guest was describing here, Jesus means it so much more, um, and that is that we are to be out there, um, uh, you know, ha having potency for the Lord, to not, to not be weak in our confession. But there is good news. You're right. We can find a restore, restoration of our saltiness in God's gifts through the sacraments. And uh, that's what we remember today as we close out our show, is that we're called to be yeah, the salt of the earth. 
And Jesus is the one who gives us our saltiness. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Benjamin Meyer. He's the pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Condit, Ohio, or at least somewhere around there. Thanks for being on the show. Glad to be with you. And folks, tomorrow, retired pastor William Knippa comes on the show to guide us through chapter 15, but all of that will have to wait till tomorrow. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with all of you as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.